It is Monday, October 9th, 2017. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm here with John Paget of Athens, Georgia, uh, for another installment of the two-party Georgia Oral History Program, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Paget, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Really do appreciate you participating. Um, just to begin with, tell us a little bit about your, your background. Where were you, you know, born and raised? I was born in Greenwood, Mississippi at the end of World War II. Uh, my dad was uh, uh, stationed there for a year as adjutant. Uh, why they had an Army air base in Greenwood, Mississippi, I still don't know. But he'd been overseas three times as a cryptographer, and they, um, he had a, a little malaria problem, so they didn't want to send him back. And that's where I came along. Uh, we moved from there to Ringo, Georgia, where my family was from. And then subsequently, um, in about the third grade, we moved down to Comer, Georgia, to the little elementary school there. And I went to school in Comer, then I went to school in Colbert, Georgia, and then uh, moved out at the end of, uh, in Athens, in the Tallahassee Road in a little house that uh, had a coal burning fireplace about yay big and no running water in the house. And uh, for about six months while we were there, my little brother and I, and I guess my mom and dad, I, I don't know about that for <laughs> sure, but we bathed in the creek. There was a hand pump in the kitchen and that's all the water we had out there. And then, uh, then we moved into Athens and became citified. And I went to Chase Street School and then there was no gap with junior high back then. I went straight from elementary school to high school and graduated from Athens High. Uh, in 1963, subsequently went to University of Georgia, uh, uh, majored in uh, business. Uh, my main course of study was marketing, and then went out into the business world. I was in the business world up until three or four months ago. This has nothing to do with politics, but it has to do with Athens. Where were the city limits back then? Oh, goodness gracious, they were. Uh, not too far outside of Five Points. And uh, as I remember, uh, maybe maybe Hawthorne uh, yeah. on the Prince Avenue side of town. And uh, I think maybe the river on the Atlanta Highway, maybe they went out that far. I know outside the river going up the hill in Athens, outside of Athens they were out of, in the county. Was there, was there a big culture gap between Athens City, for, because we're in the smallest county in the state, uh, geographically mm -hmm. speaking, um, and today they're unified and everybody thinks of Athens, Clark County as this one you know, relatively homogenous unit. Was, was there a culture gap, a, a politics gap, and a, a, a class gap between city and... and as growing up here, uh, I, I didn't recognize that. Sure. sure. Uh, I had friends from neighborhoods all over the city uh, as a little boy. And I, I just don't remember that. I, there, when I got to the University of Georgia, I think there were ten or 12,000 students at the university. Mm -hmm. They were building um, a couple of the girls' dorms there on Baxter Street, uh, Brumby and uh, whatever the other one there was that they were building back then as I was in school. And no, um, it was just a quiet, almost little country town. It was not a, uh, it's not anything like it is today with the university the size it is and, uh, and the growth of the, of the county. Okay, so let, let's talk about that a little bit. How, you were in business, real estate, insurance, um, from the fire sector as they mm -hmm. say. Um, explain or walk me through the sort of growth of Athens from that small country county to uh, a relatively major metropolitan, not metropolitan, but, but urbanized. Well, it, it appeared to me that, of course, the university had sustained growth. I don't know that they ever had a huge growth in students uh, in one year. Mm -hmm. It was just a trickle, uh, seemed to me like. Of course, I've been here for 65 years. Um, but uh, we had growth as far as facilities were concerned here at the university. And because we were a university town, uh, it seemed to have brought uh, uh, some cultural aspects that maybe a town the size of Athens without the university would not have had. 
And then we were fairly well located, uh, close to the uh, city of Atlanta, mm -hmm. and we had a tendency to gravitate economically in that geographic direction. And, um, and it's just uh, continued to grow with, uh, with the businesses here, uh, even though, I'll have to say, uh, in my political opinion, there have been times when uh, Athens is, uh, the political structure in Athens has not lent itself well uh, for business growth, but it's sort of grown. Uh, I can remember sitting uh, years ago at having breakfast in, in the Beachwood Shopping Center and at eight o'clock looking out and seeing the parking lot beginning to fill up and Alps Road traffic going up and down Alps Road and Baxter and thinking it doesn't really matter what the government does to us in business, we're going to figure a way to be successful in business. And that's what's happened in athens Clark County. Do you think that's been a relatively uh, recent development in terms of, of, of government, whether you want to call it a pro-business climate or something like that? Um, because thinking back into the 70s and 80s with governor, or not governors, mayors rather, like Upshaw Bentley and, and I guess what you would call an Athens establishment or something like that. Has that been sort of a post-unified uh, government um, development? It came, um, I think the government could have been considered or would have been considered if you were trying to put a label on it, uh, um, pro-business until about the time um, that we elected Gwen O'Looney and we had consolidated. And I'll have to say that, uh, um, in my opinion, most of Gwen's term, uh, she was pro-business. Uh, I don't know how she was perceived at the time, but that's the way I perceived her. Uh, after that, uh, with the election of uh, Heidi Davidson, uh, the um, pro-business um, aspect of the government kind of waned and we ended up with a kind of government where we're not exactly pro-business, but we're trying to be more pro-people, I guess. And, um, but in, in the long run, uh, even with that, and we can argue the good points and the bad points of the kind of government we had, Athens has done well economically. Mm -hmm. And I've heard of people say, well, it's because of the University of Georgia. Well, certainly it had a lot to do with right. it. Uh, but it it's also has to do with uh, the government we've had here. As, uh, they don't just walk down the street and say, you're out of business and you're <laughs> in business. Uh, a lot of things we could have done different that I think would have been better, but that's just my opinion at my age. <laughs> okay, so so the political culture of Athens. Uh, we were talking briefly before, before we turned on the camera. Um, Athens in 2017 is not perceived as a hotbed of Republican activity. Uh, what was the, what you know? Georgia was a democratic state for a very long time. What was the political culture here in Athens, Clark County, um, as you were you were growing up as a, as a as a young adult, as a young professional? It was a very moderate community. Um, you know, we um, I, I don't remember which mayor uh, somewhere along the time of Jack Wells, mm. probably, and maybe. Uh, who came after that, uh, Lauren, uh, Lauren and uh, Upshaw and, and uh, those guys, and Chambers. Mm -hmm. um, when, we put the, uh, when we put the bus system in, that changed some of the economic and uh, business culture in town because we were able to move around a little more inexpensively, but it also brought a lot of federal programs Sure. With it. And uh, we can argue till the cows come home whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for a community. Um, but regardless, in my opinion, uh, that changed some of what we were doing here in Athens um, about that time. What, what federal programs? Oh, how about this? Well, any, what what any, year would that have been there about? Oh, goodness, probably, uh, I, I don't, I can't remember, probably in the 60s, I guess. Okay. 70s, okay. I guess. I can't remember. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if it was Jack Wells, yeah. 60s, and Buddy Snow was around yeah. er, early 60s. Yeah. Um, okay. And then sometime after that, um, you know, politics in Georgia changed. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, but the state went a little more Republican, uh, with the, especially with the election of Governor Purdue. Mm -hmm. But it was heading that way anyhow. And then um, with the election of Governor Purdue, the state almost ran to the right, and uh, except for Athens. <laughs> uh, Athens has remained a town that has been about 60, 40 for years. And actually right now it appears to be maybe seven, uh, 65, 35 right now, Republican and Democrat. And uh, whether or not it'll swing the other way in Clark County, who's to know, we'll just, we'll see. What's your, what are the explanatory factors for why Athens remains? Because if you look at the map, it's, it's, there's blue Athens surrounded by red northeast Georgia. Well, you know, I think, you know, you don't want to put the labels on things if you don't have to. But the fact is that um, uh, most universities are relatively liberal mm -hmm. uh, with their voting habits. Uh, both with the students today and then maybe in the past and of course with the faculty and staff. And uh, that's a, a relatively good sized chunk of the population in Clark County. Uh, as I recall, uh, we've been pretty liberal. We were the only county, I believe, in the state that voted for Dukakis. <laughs> so um, uh, every, uh, while the rest of the state was changing a little bit, Athens, Clark County really has it politically. Oh. Okay, so how did you get involved in, in, in Republican politics? When, when about? Um, I don't know, probably 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. I, I got invited to go to a Clark County Republican um, committee meeting. Okay. And um, I, um, I didn't know what I was going to accomplish. I just got invited to go. And I kind of liked the vibe of the meeting. I enjoyed the people that were there. And I um, uh, ultimately paid my dues. And there weren't a lot of them. There weren't a lot of Republicans there. But somehow I managed to get elected right after that first meeting. I hadn't been going long. I got elected to, to, the, uh, uh, to represent Clark County at, at a district and state convention as a delegate. I went to a district convention that was over in the edge of Gwinnett County, I believe. Uh, John Leonard was our congressman, mm -hmm. and he had a district then that went from, I believe, Tucker to Athens and North, as I recall. And I went to that meeting, and they were having district elections. I didn't know 10 people there, uh, but I decided I'd run. So I ran for first vice chairman of the district. And there were four of us running. And uh, they elected somebody else. Well, then there was a second vice chair. Mm -hmm. And there were three of us running. And they elected somebody else. And there was a third <laughs> vice chair. And there were two of us running. They elected somebody else. So I won the fourth vice chair of the <laughs> district, which put me on the district executive committee. Right which gave me some inroads into both district politics and state politics. And that's how I uh, got into Republican politics. So how would you situate yourself uh, ideologically within the Georgia Republican Party at that time? Uh, at the time? Yeah. Um, I think I was just kind of a standard Republican, middle-of-the-road Republican at the time. Mm -hmm. I've become much more conservative as the years have gone by mm -hmm. than I was when I first joined the party. So what, what were your first uh, elections or campaigns that you worked on? That I worked on? Yeah. Um, gee, I don't know. Probably lenders campaigns mm -hmm. uh, we worked on. And um, let's see. Um, Worked on all the governor's races back then. Um, I worked on Newt's campaign. I was a co-chair for Newt for the county. Uh, of course, Sonny Perdue and, and uh, of course, Nathan. Uh, I worked, um, I remember I worked uh, uh, on, uh, good Lord, memory doesn't serve me well, but a couple of state uh, 
gubernatorial races before um, before Nathan. I mean, before Sonny. Okay. And, okay. Uh, and that's sort of the ones that I got involved in. I was involved in all the local races here when we, back before we consolidated, and you actually identifying as a Republican or a Democrat. Okay. So you mentioned how you've become um, maybe more conservative over time. Is that also true of the Republican Party of I, Georgia? I think so, yes. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is? Uh, because I think that so, so many Republicans uh, disliked what the Democrat Party was beginning to stand for, that it made them much more conservative in their own thinking, to be honest with you, than they might have been without the direction that the Democrat Party was going in. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had then uh, along the line uh, came the uh, Christian conservative right. branch of the party, which drove the party for a few years, and they're still very active in the party. And um, the, uh, that abortion issue has had a lot to do with direction up and, and it still does. Mm -hmm. And then especially with the base of the party, and then you have uh, the gun issue that's a big issue uh, and to the base of the party and Republicans in general. Uh, those kind of things, I think, have actually driven the direction of the party to some great extent. And then the smaller government, less taxes. The things that they talk about now when they go out on the stump now were the things, I think, that drove the party uh, to, to the point where we are now. So you've, you've mentioned several of the issues. Um, now, one I wanted to touch on was the Christian right. Um, very contentious um, within the Republican Party um, when Christian conservatives around 1988 with Pat Robertson, sort of upstart presidential campaign, um, and then some, some state, statewide campaigns uh, and elsewhere in Georgia. Why do you think there was a friction there? Because uh, as, as you've mentioned, these are conservative issues that have uh, energized what is now considered the base of the party? Well, I, I just think that um, if you look at the Republican Party, mm -hmm. if you go to a Georgia Republican state convention, let's say, okay. uh, and you're trying to identify Republicans in general, at a state convention, the conservative aspect of that convention, let's say, is about this big. As you get away from the base of the party, it kind of grows and grows and grows until you end up with a voting base of Republicans that are not nearly as conservative as a group than they are those conservatives that drive the party. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just whether or not somebody, how many people want to get active and involved in the party mm -hmm. and, and their thinking when they get involved in the party. That has a lot to do with where we are today. And um, somehow along the lines, uh, we started drawing as a group of Republican lines in the sand. Either you were really for, you were really pro-life or you were pro-life on most of the pro-life issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have a, a race like we had uh, with Romney, uh, where Romney got, Romney in my estimation was a much better candidate than the Democrat candidate. He should have been president. He'd made a, I think he'd have made a good president. And this is 2012. Right. But he got beat because there were several million, in my estimation, several million Republicans that just didn't go vote for whatever reason. Could be religion, could be his religion, whatever it was. When I, when I became chairman of the party the next summer, uh, we were still fighting over why we had lost that race. <laughs> As the Democrats I mean, we are got in 2017? Yeah, when we got to the, uh, to the state convention, that was a... That was a problem, and those of us that were trying to be in leadership positions could uh, would could understand that this could be a problem over into the next election, and the next election was going to be a gubernatorial election in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, as a state party, started going about the state. I made 
Well, in four years, I made about 300 speeches, and the majority of them probably within the first two or two and a half years of my chairmanship. And what we would, and I had staff that did the same thing. So we were going all over the state, and our message was, we got to forget what happened to us with Romney, and we got to get together and decide that we're going to vote Republican. And whoever the Republican candidate is, we got to figure out that that's going to be better for us than anybody the Democrats might put up to run against. And as it turned out, they put up a pretty good crowd to run against us in that uh, 2014 was in that 2014 race state. because they had uh, Nunn and Carter. Uh, and a lot Familiar of money. names. Yeah, <laughs> and a lot of money. And, uh, and of course, we had a knockdown drag out for Senate, and then, uh, and then we had to turn right around and, and get over that. And if you were a Kingston guy, you had to get over that so you could go support uh, David. And uh, that's what we spent the preponderance of our time other than raising money to support the party. That's what we spent the preponderance of our time doing was getting people back in line to be Republicans to go, to go vote. So let's, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, what was your thought, thought process of getting uh, to where you wanted to run for state party chairman? I, <laughs> I don't know. What in the world was I what thinking? What were you thinking? <laughs> I, uh, um, I had been, I had held several state party positions. Um, I'd been county chair uh, four different times. I'd been district chair in two different districts, depending on how the districts the 11th were, and the 12th. had aligned themselves. Uh, I had been a regional vice chair of the party. Uh, that was We don't have that position anymore, but we, right. I, we were responsible for about 30 or 35 counties so, uh, estimate apiece, four of us. Uh, then I was um, assistant secretary and then secretary. And at the uh, state convention going in to the next race for chairman, um, I thought that Bert Guy, who is now a Superior Court judge down in uh, southeast Georgia, uh, was going to run for chairman and I was going to support, support Bert. And at, uh, uh, I think we were at the, uh, We were at maybe a national convention. I can't remember the timing, but he told me, he said, I'm not running. And uh, he said, I'm gonna spend my time with my family and my law practice. And I thought, well, if Bert's not running, here I am. Uh, I, I had run for secretary and I was secretary, which was a, one of the higher elected positions mm -hmm. in the party. And I knew people all over the state, so I decided to run for chairman. And it was a, it was a fairly good knockdown drag out. There were four of us running, and uh, and uh, but anyway, I came out of that convention winning. You can hold that position three times for two-year terms, and that's what uh, your predecessor um, Sue Everhart yeah, had I done. I think that um, if I remember right, um, Alec Pointevent maybe had held the job for four years and skipped. Two years and came back for two years, I believe, if I'm yes, right. Yes, he had a 89 through, I believe, 93, and then he came back in when Sonny Perdue was elected. Right, and then Sue held the job for six years, mm -hmm. and then I had it for four years. And uh, past, uh, back in all the years of chairman, there haven't been very many of the chairmen that held the job more than two years, mm -hmm. very few of them. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting job. <laughs> It, I, well, we'll talk about that a little bit. <laughs> so, so, you mentioned it was a knockdown dragout. What, you know, what were the what were the main issues? What were the points of contention between you and your main opponent? And your main opponents were, were Alex Johnson, who most yeah. people would be probably more familiar with. B.J. Van Gundy. Um, I forget the 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 other. Well, I think that the main issue was that uh, B.J. and I. Um, Felt, I, I don't want to put words in BJ's mouth, but BJ and I felt like the party was the party and we were supposed to do everything we could do to support the party and we were to support those folks that were elected as Republicans. Okay. Uh, Ellis Johnson's position basically was uh, the chairman's job is if, if we don't, if my group doesn't agree 
with the elected officials, we're to go do battle with the elected officials. And my position always has been that uh, as chairman, when the Republicans in the state of Georgia elected someone to go to the state house or any of the elected officers from the governorship on down or to Congress, House and Senate, then the base of the party or the Republicans that voted for these people, that's who uh, were to decide whether they were doing the right job and making the right votes. And if they didn't, and I always said, if you think this guy's a rhino or you don't like this guy or you don't like his positions, then throw his butt out. <laughs> And I heard a, when the first two years I was chairman, I heard rhino, 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 rhino everywhere I this went. This is Republican in name only. Right. So we have an election, and they, they literally turned nobody out. They elected the same group. So I, I had a decision to try to make was, well, if they're rhinos and we don't like them, but we vote them back in, kind of puts the chairman in a conundrum. I mean... What's the chairman supposed to do? Well, what I did was what I said I was going to do the whole time, which was to support uh, the elected officials. And, I, and that was the difference between Alex Johnson and I think B.J. and I both. So, so I mean, I guess this is an issue that's, that, that's come up in your re-election. Well, Alex Johnson squared off again in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, where do with, I don't want to call them, I don't know if he called them purity tests, but that's what, what most people, political pundits and observers would say, these party purity tests and things like that. Why do you think you were able to overcome that challenge uh, from, from perhaps the more ideological Well, I think the, the majority of the people that were at that convention that voted understood that the chairman's job was not to go out and have a fight with the governor all the time. Uh, you, you, you can't, I mean, the governor is the governor and the Republicans in the state of Georgia elected him and they re-elected him. So if they didn't like him, they didn't like what he was doing, they had a chance to throw him out mm -hmm. and they didn't do that. In fact, very few of the folks that we've elected in the last four, five, six years have we turned out. And, and I must have done something right as chairman because we didn't lose, we didn't lose any ground in the House and Senate, and we reelected or elected for every major Republican seat in the state a Republican. We didn't lose anything in four years with the state demographics changing at every step of the way along the way. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But what were some of the issues that, or issues or policies rather, that perhaps put the the governor, Governor Deal? his administration uh, at loggerheads with more ideological or, or, or programmatic conservatives well, like Alex I think, Johnson uh, and others. I think this, the spending issue, uh, okay. although as, and, and uh, Governor Deal has been a great governor, I mean a great governor, and we've increased our revenue. In fact, if, if he were making a speech, if he didn't mention it, he needs to, he, he should mention every time the rainy day fund, which had enough money, I think, when he got elected to run the state for about a week or something mm. like that, if something bad happened, and it's got millions of dollars in it now. And this is over a less than four-year period. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty spiffy. We've been, we've been uh, uh, selected, I think, four times in a row as the best state in the country to do business in. Uh, we brought the mu movie industry yeah. to Georgia. Um, more films been, here than in Hollywood. Absolutely, and we've we've got more uh, uh, more great business growth here than just about any state in the country. Uh, now, can you be critical that we spend too much money? Well, we may spend too much money, but we got a we got a law in Georgia that you got to have a balanced budget, so it. You, if you spend your budget, who's to say whether you spent too much money or a lot? And you can be a, you can be a conservative, conservative, conservative person, and you can say, well, what we really ought to do is take ten percent of that money and give it back to all of us. Well, that's probably not going to happen with any governor. Uh, they had a big brouhaha on a transportation bill right, right. at the end of the session. Uh, that that 
maybe you could be critical about, but let's see how critical we want to be in 10, 15 years when we finish all this road work in Georgia. We'll see. I don't think we're going to find much to be too critical about. Um, my taxes haven't gone up, um, and we're getting all this road work done. And then you had the, uh, the uh, religious freedom. Still, still a major and, issue. And still a major issue. And you had the uh, gun issue for college campuses. Right. I think those were probably the biggest issues that we were dealing with. And the governor and the House and Senate, which included the lieutenant governor, uh, the president of the Senate, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, David Ralston in the House. Mm, the speaker. Those, those were probably the biggest issues that, were, that kept some Republicans kind of stirred up as they rocked along. So uh, while you're trying to avoid dust-ups over, over these issues between you know, maybe the governor and the grassroots or the governor and, and conservative activists, what is it that you were trying to do sort of nuts and bolts-wise as to, head as, of the party? I was trying to, as we got through the uh, qualifying process and the uh, primary, my job is to get them all elected. The, my, my job is to get them all elected. Mm -hmm. And we spent, and I, and I was criticized, but we spent in Governor Deal's election and David Perdue's election literally all the money that we had available with us to spend. This is the 2014 cycle. Because I didn't want to end up with half a million dollars in the bank and Perdue got beat. That wasn't going to fly. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, uh, I had... Um, as chairman, uh, I had the opportunity to work really close to the RNC, the House Committee, the Senate Committee, and the Governor's Association. And uh, we were trying to get David Perdue elected senator, and we had uh, one of the major players in the uh, Senate Committee came down to see me the week before the election. Uh, during the week right before the election on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And we had a meeting at my office, and he said, uh, Chairman, uh, you're going to have a runoff in the Purdue race. I said, no, no, we're not. He said, yeah, you're going to have a runoff in the Purdue race. I said, no, we're not. Now, I had access to the internal polling. He, he didn't. He said, I'm coming down here next week, and I'm going to bring you a big check. I won't say how much it was, but it was a big check. And we're going to win that runoff. So uh, we didn't have a runoff. And I waited about a week, and I called him, and I said, Hey, the um, way I look at it, I saved you at least half that money you were going to send to me down here. I said, How about just sending me a check? He <laughs> said, Chairman, I already sent you money to Louisiana. So <laughs> I didn't get to keep any of the money. But... The, we weren't mismanaging. We were we were just being sure that the odds were stacked as much in Governor Deal and David Perdue's um, favor as we could make them be in their favor. And I think that's what the chairman of the party is supposed to make those tough decisions, and that's what we did. Talking about money and resources, running a political party or being the head of a political party, how has that changed in sort of the Post Citizens United universe in, in terms of raising money with the rise of super PACs and, and uh, the, these outside groups that can spend limitless money. Well, it's it's. Um, I know I, I had a, I got a call from Ryan Priebus um, sometime in I guess my second second year, and he was coming to Atlanta to do a fundraiser for the RNC. And he wanted me to come along with him, so I I, I went with him, and and uh, we had about twenty five or thirty big Republican donors in the room, and Riots uh, made a nice presentation, and basically what and he had a chalk whiteboard, and basically what he said, and he put up at the top, you need to give your money to RNC, and then what money you don't give the RNC, these are different packs that you can give the money to. And then down here at the bottom, almost falling off the board, was the Georgia GOP. <laughs> now, uh, that wasn't anything but just the way things were working then and continue to work now. Um, 
But that's just the way it's going to be for a while. It's going to be harder. If you don't get the folks that are elected, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that are elected officials, if you don't get your governor and your senators and your House members and the members under the gold on House and Senate, if you can't get some help from them raising money, just the party raising money is extremely difficult. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that Chairman Watson is not going to be extremely, who's our new chairman now, not going to be ex extremely, extremely uh, successful at raising money. I, I think that he will be as good as anybody we've ever had in the job. But it's still a lot harder uh, than it used to be uh, because of the, the rules of uh, giving to, to different entities. What, what does it mean operationally uh, for a party to, to, to work under those, constraint, those financial constraints? What, what were you able to do with money? What would a party be able to do with, with, with less money? Yeah, well, there wasn't anything that I, wasn't, that I, I had a problem not doing. Uh, I, I bought in pretty big time to a minority engagement program. Uh, I staffed that program. I funded that program. Uh, some people in the party could say, well, you know, did you do any good? Well, I don't know. You don't know about something like that until probably 10 years down the road. I can say it's a, uh, it, it should be part of what we're doing because if we don't have some, if everybody votes Republican looks like me in the next 10 years, we're going to get our clock cracked. I can just tell you it's not going to work. So um, I think that... Um, I think that probably, uh, I, I don't know that there was anything that I wasn't able to get the money together to, to accomplish to do mm -hmm. as chairman as far as running the party on an ordinary daily political basis. Um, I, th I, just, I, I don't think of anything. It wasn't our job to raise money, to raise a lot of money to give to uh, a guy running uh, for a state house seat down in Cockwood County. That wasn't our job. Uh, it was our job, though, to have enough money available through our victory program, which was different than just the operational program. The okay. victory program is the political side of the party. And we raised a lot of money in the victory program. Now, uh, we, were, we have very uh, specific rules that we can spend that victory money on. Uh, but staying within the rules, we had enough money to do those jobs. Obviously, we did because we, we won everything that we were supposed to win. So you've mentioned the Victory Party. What, what were the main, um, not, not necessarily goals, but the responsibilities mm -hmm. of the party? You've mentioned also uh, minority, recruit, uh, minority engagement. Mm -hmm. What about candidate recruitment or education? Both of those are important. Uh, in today's world, mm -hmm. registering people to vote, and turning out the vote. Uh, Karen, Handel, Karen Handel's race um, over there turned out to be a race to see who's going to turn out the vote. Right. And if you remember, you've heard for years and years about this great program the Democrats had, man, we're registering folks and we're going to turn out the vote. We made, in, in the Governor Deal's race, the Georgia Republican Party, I think, made if I remember right, something like two million contacts. We did the same thing in the next two years later. I mean, we, we knew how to run a statewide party political race. Mm -hmm. And we registered the folks and we turned them out. And we really turned them out. And I just think that's, that's how you win elections, you know. You want to pay your power bill, that's important. But on the other hand, uh, you've got to be able to organize, and we've got 150 or 60 counties in the state, whatever it might be. 159. 59. Um, and in all of those counties, except for maybe 15 or so, we had a county organization. And every one of them, Democrats didn't have that, that I could ever find. And you, can, you say, well, why do you want to spend the money organizing a county down here where you might pick up 1,000 votes? Because... 20 of those counties might mean 50,000 votes when you put them in a big block. Mm -hmm. And 50,000 votes down the road may win a statewide election. 
So it's important to get them all turned out, no matter whether they're here in Athens. Our job as a party in Athens, if nothing else, is to get the Republican vote that's here in Athens and turn them out. Mm -hmm. So e even if you ne don't necessarily win the county or carry the county, but sort of mitigating your losses. Um, yeah, and you have to understand this. The governor, when, he, when, when uh, uh, Governor Deal ran for office, he had a statewide organization, uh, but his statewide organization wasn't really geared towards turning out the vote. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen Handel had a good organization over there in the 6th, but our job, what we knew how to do, was to turn out the vote. And that's not being critical of anybody. That's just, that's just where we are as a party. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Sort of the, the um, logistical side yes. uh, of elections. Okay. So you mentioned the 2014 uh, election cycle a couple times with, with, with this Governor Nathan Deal's reelect. Uh, but the Senate race, as I recall, that was a very high profile race. Several uh, high profile candidates, um, David Perdue, um, who's obviously the cousin of the former governor, uh, Jack Kingston, Congressman down Savannah, uh, Paul Brown. Our former congressman here, uh, Phil Gingry, Karen Handel. There may have been others that I, uh, I apologize in advance for <laughs> leaving out if I did. How, how and why did that, that, that race break down the way it did, or the result in the well, way we it had, did? Well, we, we managed as a party, I, I don't know, probably seven or eight regional debates that turned out to be pretty significant because uh, you could get at uh, those debates, all of them, it seemed to me like you get some pretty good feel for uh, uh, actually what the candidate had to say and what he stood for or she stood for and something about the support they were getting on a local basis by the size of the crowd. Um, I think that uh, uh, we as a party have to stay out of those things other than doing things like, man, I can't pick, uh, you know, I can't pick who I want to win in a primary. That's not the chairman's job. In fact, our rules, I know Mayor Denson just got in a problem with her local yes. Democrat party here, which I hated to see happen, uh, but uh, that was their rules, Rule, I suppose, yep. so they, yep. they uh, weren't gonna make an exception um, for her. Uh, and having a fundraiser for a young man who professes to be a Republican, and I believe that he's going to be a really great one down the road. Uh, but uh, th that being said, uh, that was a really difficult race. There were so many people, and so many of them went into that race with a portion of the electorate already in the bag for them. Right. It, a lot of that uh, didn't change. Now, what I thought that David Perdue did probably better than anybody else, was he had a, he really did have a, a really good ground game. Uh, the Georgia Republican Party in the general election had a great ga ground game, but he, David really had a good ground game. He had a telephone bank that worked and worked and worked. Uh, he had people on the ground uh, supporting the get out the vote effort, and he, he raised a good bit of money, and he made a, he, he looked senatorial. I mean, David and David Perdue, in my estimation, has got bigger, bigger things ahead of him politically than a United States senator, which is pretty dang big. Uh, but I, I think he's got a long way he can go in politics if he wants to go. He's a great United States senator. You were chairman during 2016, mm -hmm. uh, well, which will go down as a very historic uh, election. How was Donald Trump? Very successful, by, by any definition, uh, businessman, showman, mm -hmm. able to walk into the, the Republican Party mm -hmm. um, and run roughshod through the primaries mm -hmm. over names like Jeb Bush, uh, Marco Rubio, mm -hmm. Ted Cruz from the ideological, more ideological wing, uh, Bobby Jindal, mm -hmm. Lindsey Graham, you know, take your pick. How how was that able to happen? Well, you can look at you can look at what uh, President Trump did, and you can say, well, I don't like his tweets. Uh, I don't like some of the things he said about the other candidates. I didn't like his demeanor in the debate. 
I didn't like this, I didn't like this, and I didn't like this. But I, I tell you what I can tell you about mm -hmm. it. There was a um, rally at the Fox Theater. And uh, I was one of the folks that was honored to do some of the preliminary, uh, get the crowd excited. Uh, I don't know, I don't look like the kind of person that's a crowd excitement guy, but that was part of my job for that. And um, so I had an opportunity to go upstairs uh, in the Fox. What they were using for a green room or the pre-stage room was upstairs. Right. And my wife Mary and I went upstairs and, and um, uh, Mr. Trump at the time was going to come there first. There were maybe a dozen people in the room. Most of them were part of his campaign. And he came in and um, uh, one of his staffers took Mary and I over to meet him. And uh, we talked. And then he asked a couple of questions and he listened. And he asked a couple other questions and he listened. And my wife said, well, Mr. Trump, you got this um, saying, keep America great again. And something had just happened, um, terrorist attacks or something. And she said, you know, I think you ought to use the, the phrase, keep America safe again. And he said, you know, he said, Miss Paget, I really like that. That's really good. He said, would you mind if I use that? So he, we go downstairs, and Mary and I are on the front row, and he's standing right in front of us, and he makes a speech, and the crowd goes wild. And he comes down to walk around the handshake line, and he gets to us, and he says, Mr. Chairman, was that good for Georgia? I said, yes, that was really good. Right before he finished, he said, you know, look, there's a lady here that told me I ought to use this phrase, keep America safe again, and he pointed down to Mary, and he walked by. The point I'm trying to make is you ask, how did he do what he mm -hmm. did? Because he listened. He didn't run over you with his mouth. If you had something to say, and he, it wasn't something he agreed with particularly, he didn't run right through you or run right by you. He talked to you. He listened to you. He was very gracious. There was nothing egotistical about the man whatsoever. I mean, that, in my estimation, that's how he did it. He got out into these crowds, and whatever the crowds were going to want him to say and want him to be for, he just happened to say and be for. And I, I think that he was sincere um, because he's been saying so much of what he's trying to do right now. He's been saying that we ought to do this for the last He's been saying it for 10 years. And I just think that had an awful lot to do with it. And the other thing that I think helped him get elected, uh, by the way, was his family. Mm -hmm. I just think they, through that campaign process, and I've met them all, they're just genuinely nice people. And they listen. What do you think the, the of course, we're only a few months into to, to the, the, his presidential term. What do you think that impact or effect uh, of a Donald Trump presidency is going to have on the Republican Party, um, its policies, maybe its, its trajectory of where it's going? Well, it's probably going to be maybe a little bit more moderate. Moderate, well, moderate how? Well, it's probably going to be a little bit more moderate with some of its social issues maybe. Um, I don't think it's going to be more moderate as far as um, uh, trying to uh, protect us with the military and do the things that are necessary to be done. But who's to know? When we get to the, if he gets elected and has eight years, that, that when you get to the next election, that's what it's all about is whether somebody's going to change what we've done for the last eight years or not. He's undoing everything he can undo that Obama did. Mm -hmm. God bless him for it. But when, if he doesn't get this stuff, any of this stuff, through Congress, if he's just doing this through executive decisions, uh, we're going to be back, if we're not careful, sure. in the next election to elect a Democrat. If we elect a Democrat in the next election, they're going to be farther left than Obama was because that's what they got available to them to run. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then we're going to be right back in the same situation that we were with Obama. During uh, election night, if you flipped over um, you know, or 
pulled up a website or something, you were looking at the map of Georgia and how it was voting, and you saw that Hillary Clinton had, had carried Cobb County, Gwinnett County, Henry County, uh, you, you know, you, anybody who's, who's you know, looked at Georgia politics knows those are, used to be ruby red mm -hmm. conservative Republican counties. Uh, why was Hillary Clinton able to carry those counties uh, and, and still lose um, the state of Georgia? Not by a super wide margin. She, but, she but, picked up some never Trumpers. Okay. And I think that was the main thing she did. In fact, some of the never Trumpers are still available to you out there now. Um, and I think that was the biggest thing. I, I knew that we, because I, 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 I don't really pay attention to a lot of polls, but internal polling, big time internal polling, doesn't miss it much. Mm -hmm. And this is not the polling that you see out there on Fox News. And it, it, aggravated, it aggravated me to no end. I'd watch a map of the United States every night and it would start up here about Virginia and go to Texas, and it was red, 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 and it'd come down to Georgia and be red, 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 <laughs> and it'd get to Georgia and it'd be blue or purple for months, for months. And it, it wasn't going to happen. Now, it could happen sometime, but it's, it wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it was closer than I would have liked for it to have been, but um, I, I'll, you know, there was a lot of money got spent in Georgia. Uh, politically, mm -hmm. so um, you know, I was happy with the way it turned out. Well, as chairman, obviously. Yeah. So in two thousand, you've already mentioned uh, the sixth district race in twenty seventeen. Uh, that was Tom Price's mm -hmm. district. Um, I think I was listening to the political rewind on GPV a while ago, and they were talking about the the way the sixth district w was drawn. There was actually more Democrats in the sixth district because. Uh, former Representative Tom Price was sort of on the outs mm -hmm. with, with, with the deal administration. Um, it was still a strongly Republican district. Why was John Ossoff, uh, a, a relatively unknown Democrat, 30-something, able to, one, raise about $35 million and, and able to find 48% of that district to vote Republican, or well, excuse me, couple, Democrat. A couple of things. Number one, he didn't have anybody running against him. Mm -hmm. So he was in a general election mode from the get-go. Okay. Um, he had an awful lot of national uh, re uh, Democrat money that came floating into Georgia, a lot, a lot, more than we did from everywhere in the country, including New York and California, mm -hmm. a lot. And then we had a rather difficult primary. We were yeah, 11 with. or so Republicans, yeah, I believe. Yeah, I mean, it was just one of those tough primaries. And uh, uh, and we weren't able, we, we could talk to people about going to vote, we could talk to people about registering to vote, mm -hmm. but we couldn't really say, you need to go vote for Karen because we didn't have Karen as a candidate. We, we were just stuck. Right. And... Uh, so he got a he had several months of general campaign mode and he had good he had some pretty good people working with him, pretty good national people. He ran a pretty good campaign. But I never thought Karen Handel was gonna lose that race because I oops, excuse me. Because I, uh, I I knew how hard we were working out there in the sixth district to get people to go vote. And we I knew if we could get them to go vote, then we were gonna win that race. And that's ultimately what happened. Do you think there was, you think it was a case of, because uh, John Ossoff, as I recall, got 48.1% in, in the, the special election, yep. and he got 48.1% in the, in the, in the runoff. Mm -hmm. it, was it just a case of there weren't enough Democrats yeah. to find but, in but the 6th district? And they didn't turn out enough of their vote. It turned out a little more vote they might have won, mm -hmm. but they didn't have, uh, you know, it's one thing put yard signs out. And I've, I've seen a lot of campaigns where you, you won the yard sign battle, but you lost the election. And yard signs are important. They give you some little indication about what's going on in a, in a race. Uh, but getting people to go vote is what's important. See, in the general election, as an example, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, we, uh, when uh, it was um, uh, Nathan's first uh, Governor Deals, for when his re-election came along. Okay. 
Um, our campaign folks in my office, we decided that uh, we were going to make hundreds of thousands of phone calls, but we were not going to call people like me. In other words, they knew I was going to go vote. Right. I voted Republican every year they could find me all the way back. <laughs> we, we, we keyed on people that were maybes, you know, and non-typical off-year election people. That's who we went after. So not R plus sixes, but R plus didn't one. Even, didn't even question mark. We didn't even give a blink to the R sixes. Gotcha. R R fives or the R fours, literally. We might have sent them a mailer, but I mean we really didn't. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> but we went. We were out there to turn out the vote of the rest of them. Okay. And that's what we shot at, and that's what we hit. Mm -hmm. now, off your elections, you know, the, the conventional wisdom, and I think it bears out somewhat with the, with the evidence that, that Democratic voters um, don't vote as much in, in midterm elections. Do you think that, do you think that has to do with, with organizationally, uh, party work, why don't why do Republican voters, since you were former Republican chairman, why do Republican voters outperform Democratic voters in terms of turnout in those non-presidential years? Passion. Probably passion. I think our voters are more passionate. Mm -hmm. I think you see some passion on TV and in the press from the Democrats, but when you when you drop down a couple of layers about who's going to get up on Tuesday and actually go vote, I think our folks have more passion. You think that might change if... if, if I think we'll have the passion. But we see we've, we've brought in, uh, or brought, not brought in, but we've, we've uh, there have been about a million new folks moved to Georgia in the last 10 years, I right. think. And my estimation would be that um, less than 50% of them are probably Republicans. Okay. Well, that sort of, that sort of transitions us into the, the next sort of qu questions I want to talk about. But it took you've been involved with the Republican Party for a very long time. Um, involved when the Republican Party was, uh, if not the most desperate minority party, but a, a distinct minority party. How were the Republicans in this state able to go from minority party to competitive party um, to now? A relatively dominant majority governing party. The the parties, the Republican Party became more conservative, and the Democrat Party became more liberal. And the people that were living in the state of Georgia were not more liberal, <laughs> and they left the party. Okay, they just left the party. And you've got folks out there now, in my estimation, that are old timey Democrats. Some of them my age that in a local election are going to vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. But in a statewide election, they're going to vote Republican. What, and, and this was something you could see presidential election-wise. You know, Barry Goldwater carried the state. Richard Nixon carried, of course, Richard Nixon mm -hmm. was going to carry the state against George McGovern in 72. Ronald Reagan carried the state. Uh, but at the same time, Georgians were electing uh, Carl Sanders, Jimmy Carter, George Busby, Joe Frank Harris, Zell Miller. Why was there why was there that disconnect between national party and, and Georgia Democrats? I think that the re, re, voting Republican in the state were satisfied with a moderate Republican until the Democrat Party started running more to the left, and they just left a great huge voting block out there looking for somewhere to go. And, they, and they, at the same time, they moved the Republican Party to the right. Is there a, a, a political space for a conservative Democrat in Georgia anymore? Well, you're talking about statewide? Yeah, yeah. Uh, doesn't appear to be because every statewide Democrat that runs these days is um, running like a Republican in a lot of aspects. Now, it could be that in this next gubernatorial race, we'll see who gets their nomination uh, you could get a pretty far left Democrat running for running for governor. Uh, that would be real interesting to, to see because our Republicans or whoever we nominate um, is going to be um, uh, 
to uh, they're going to be a pretty good conservative Republican, or they're not going to get out of the primary. Okay, so okay, let's let's talk about 2018. We'll sort of work our back our way back towards these you know, structural or philosophical questions. 2018 um, on the Democratic side, mm -hmm. you have the two Stacys, uh, former representatives, one minority leader, Stacy Abrams yeah. from DeKalb County. Um, and then former representative Stacey Evans from Smyrna down in, in Cobb County. As a former Republican state chairman, what, what is your estimation uh, of that race? Barring, and I, I don't believe there'll be another major candidate hop in. Well, I had a couple left. pretty well, I mean, people that study this pretty well said they thought it was going to be Evans. And uh, to be honest with you, until I heard that, I really thought it probably was going to be Abrams. Why but, is that? Uh, I just thought that she was going to be able to get more uh, bang for her buck when she starts spending money. She's been out there, and it, uh, on a, I would estimate more people in the state, statewide would probably know who she was as mm -hmm. opposed to a, 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 a politician that's mostly just Atlanta. But I, who knows? <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can tell you this. In the last four years, the one job in the state of Georgia that I'm glad I didn't have was the job Dubose Porter's got. <laughs> Your counterpart, I, the chairman of the Democratic Party yeah, of Georgia. Yeah. How do you think that race is going to break down in, in your, we're early, obviously qualifying is not until next April, um, but how do you think that, that race is you going to break down? You mean in the primary? Yeah, yeah, in the primary. Uh, well, it, the, the race sort of, I think right now, uh, sort of depends on um, the strength that Hunter Hill can garner. And this is on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You, is that what we're talking about, or is that what you, or you want the Democrat side? Oh, I, we were, we, yes. Well, let's the, talk about the, the Republican side. Okay, right. okay. So let's, let's uh, run through the candidates and first. And then you got, um, oh, go ahead. Okay, so, so state, you already mentioned State Senator Hunter Hill mm -hmm. um, from Atlanta, uh, State Senator... Mike Williams, um, I'm not sure where, where Mike Williams is from uh, off the top of my head. Um, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle, mm -hmm. a Gainesville Republican, Hall County Republican, mm -hmm. very familiar. Uh, Brian Kemp, mm -hmm. our fellow Athenian mm -hmm. uh, from here in Clark County, Secretary of State. Um, Clay Tippins, mm -hmm. a businessman uh, from Atlanta. I believe that's... The, the yeah, field. I was I was a little surprised. I had a couple of forums or debates this weekend. Yeah, and, yeah, um, Milledgeville and Augusta. I, I, I missed them. I was in, uh, I was playing for the Georgia Bulldogs in Nashville mm -hmm. on Saturday. You're their lucky charm, uh, apparently. You just gotta keep. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was surprised that Tippins didn't show up at uh, at least one in Milledgeville. I don't know whether he went to one in Augusta. Or not. I was surprised because one thing he needs is some name recognition. And it depends on how much of his money I think he puts into this race as whether he can influence a race or not. Right. Uh, I understand it. I, I just I haven't met him. Uh, Kemp and, and uh, Cagle uh, have name recognition from all over the state. Um, I, I would say right now that uh, probably the two of them would end up in a runoff but it sort of depends, I started to say, it sort of depends on how strong Hunter Hill becomes in this race. Mm -hmm. And and the votes that he gets, who he takes them away from. Right. And uh, that's just, uh, we don't know yet. We'll just have to wait and see. And we're way early in the thing. Uh, the Democrats have got the two Stacys. I don't think anybody else is really going to make much of a, a challenge there. And it, that one's going to be really interesting to watch. Um, you've got a liberal, and then you've got a serious liberal. And uh, that, I think it's going to tell a lot about the Democrats in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. If the Democrats in the state of Georgia have moved so far left um, that they start losing more of their base to the Republicans, then uh, we'll just see. But uh, got a long way to go. Okay. So, you know, we, we talked about sort of the transition of the parties. Why were, why were Georgia Democrats able to hold on uh, to power so long in Georgia? 
Um, well, I, I think that's an extremely good question, but I think I think it was a slow process. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like boiling water, you know, you turn the stove on, it doesn't just start boiling immediately. Right, it takes a little right. while for it to boil, and I really think that's what happened to the Democrats. I mean, they, and they had, in for the state of Georgia, they had some pretty good top-of-the-ticket Democrats running for statewide office. And it just took a little while for the water to boil, and I think it finally boiled when it boiled over, then, and uh, Sonny just was there at the right time, and a really good candidate for the state of Georgia and for the Republicans in the state of Georgia. He was a really good candidate. You know, the 2002 election, you know, we go back and, and look at it now, um, everybody chalks it up to the fact that, that, that Governor Barnes changed the, the state flag. Uh, was that the only issue, or were there other issues? No, that, that, was, that a, was a pretty big issue. You think so? Yeah, I think so. I think that was part of the pot boiling over. <laughs> well, what were, what were the other issues, or how, how was Sonny Perdue? Uh, a state senator, a party switcher mm -hmm. from, from down in, in middle Georgia, Houston County, able to overcome the, the monetary advantage that, that Roy Barnes' campaign had, sort of the, I guess, the institutional advantage the Democrats had, and the fact that Roy Barnes is a really good politician, one a of, very one, skilled politician. One of the things was that uh, uh, Sonny Perdue wasn't an uh, Atlanta lawyer. Okay. And when you stood the two of them up and looked at them, uh, you had an Atlanta lawyer that was part of the in crowd in Atlanta, and you had a middle to south Georgia um, agricultural oriented kind of guy running that was not part of the in crowd in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I just think the state was ready for something like that. And I think they made a dang good decision. He turned out to be a really good governor. Do you think that th th those geographic distinctions? Uh, you seem to intimate that that made a big because for a very long time the Republican Party of Georgia was a, a the metropolitan party the mm -hmm. you know the metropolitan donut uh, the suburban party did it how how important was it for the party to start nominating candidates like Sonny Perdue Saxby Chambliss David Perdue well it's pretty important uh, the votes are still in Atlanta I mean they're right. still there. Uh, but if you if you're running a race in Atlanta, and you're 49-51 in the race, and you get outside that donut, and all of a sudden it's 65-35 outside the donut, that's how you win, and that's why outside the donut is really important. I mean, you got big voter numbers in Augusta, you got big voter numbers in Savannah, you got big voter numbers in Macon big voter numbers in Columbus, and then you got that whole southern swath across the bottom end of the state, and they're voting. Mm -hmm. it, and that's how the Democrats were able to hold power for so long, is that they were able to win outside the donut, yep. when Republicans were still winning inside. Yep. So how, how different are the parties uh, in terms of their, their governing priorities? Some, you go back and look at a Joe Frank Harris or a Zell Miller, and now you go, you look at a Sonny Perdue or a Nathan Deal. How different are they really in terms of, of, of Well, maybe not so much prior to um, Governor Perdue. Okay. But now I'd say to uh, uh, borrow a phrase from the president, huge. <laughs> There's a huge difference. Y-U-U-G-E. Yeah. yeah. There's a huge difference. Are there any issues where, where, where Democrats and Republicans can work together? In the, it, we're talking <laughs> in Georgia. In Georgia? Yes. Yeah, I think yeah, probably in so. In Georgia. Yeah, I think probably so. Uh, I mean, I've been in the Capitol a good bit in the last four years, and, uh, you know, there's a difference, but you don't see the vitriol right. there that you see when you, when, when you get to Washington. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really bad. It, it's really bad in Washington right now, and I, I'm not sure how we. It's so bad right now. My advice to my guys is: be a Republican, vote Republican, get done what you can get done while you got the power up there. It, it you know, we're talking about Congress, Washington D.C. Republicans control White House, Senate, House of Representatives. Um, been that way since since January 20th. Um, 2017, not much has moved. 
in terms of Obamacare repeal, Affordable Care Act. Why not? Well, you've got uh, Republicans control the Senate, for instance, but they don't control it by much. Right. So you don't have to have but just a little bit of movement inside your party. And uh, as opposed to the Democrats, the Republicans do have some uh, some opportunities with some of their folks to, that don't, they're just not going to vote anyway, but the way they think they're supposed to be voting. What I don't understand about some of the people that are there and how they're voting Republicans is that my estimation, and if I can remember correctly, they got elected. The reason we've got the House and the Senate, I think, is because of Donald Trump. And um, it's not just Donald Trump. It's the people that voted for him and what they meant when they voted for him that sometimes gets lost in all of the yakking that you see on TV. But if you're in a state where people voted for Trump, in my estimation, if you want to get reelected again, you need to really pay attention to what Trump stood for and what the voters were trying to tell you, and I don't know whether we are or not. Some of our folks act like they don't care about anything except just being negative right now, and that's, that's not good for us or the country. What about here, here in Georgia? What are the Republican Party's uh, key priorities or, or, or their... Uh, their goals or their, their governing philosophy. What, what does it mean to have a Republican government <coughs> here in Georgia? Well, I think we're, I think we're it, as far as Georgia politics is concerned, we are, we are a conservative party. Uh, we are about uh, uh, smaller government and less taxes. How much smaller and how much less is up for debate inside the electorate of the party? Uh, I think we are a uh, uh, we are a, a pro education party. How we go about defining what that means is something to be left up to the voters of the party. But we pay attention to that. Uh, we are I think we are trying to be as fair as we can be in this state or uh, uh, on the immigration issue. Uh, I I just would. Um, I think we need, to, before we do anything else with immigration here in the state, we need to just sit back and watch, see what the feds do next. Um, I think that we've done a good job with our Medicaid program, mm -hmm. and that's a tough program, um, but we've done a good job with it. Uh, we haven't broken the budget, and I don't hear, a, you know, I, I don't hear an awful lot of people complaining about the Medicaid program in Georgia. They may be out there, but I don't. I am hurt them. Uh, so I think that probably that we've been a we've been a, a good uh, steward of of the government of the of the state of Georgia, and I think that's if nothing else, if we go out and in in uh, 20 years we look back at this last uh, eight or 10 years, then that's what people I think that's what the historians will find happened with uh, with Republican politics. What is the what's the greatest danger? imperiling uh, the Republican majority in this state. In Georgia? Mm -hmm. um, losing that passion to go vote. What about demographics? Uh, that's, well, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. It, it depends on how we handle the demographics. We, we turned out a big number of Latinos in the last election. Uh, during my term as chairman, I spent a lot of time uh, with uh, Asian American groups, uh, different some of the different religious groups, um, Indians, mm -hmm. um, Indian Americans. Uh, I spent some time actually with uh, uh, some Muslim Americans uh, that are really pro-business people. Um, all of these different minority groups are important for us to go and spend some time with uh, because a lot of them think and uh, the same thing we think, and a lot of them don't have a party. They're looking for a party. They don't have one. Um, the Latino group, we just have to see how the immigration issue plays out and, and how the economy plays out for Latinos in Georgia. Uh, 
hardworking, hard working, bright uh, group of voters, and uh, but we got to be sure we got jobs for everybody. And then in the black community, if if I can go, and I I had a um, two people that worked with me in the minority engagement program in the last uh, four years, Lisa Kenamore and. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm uh, my 72 year old mind just uh, no worries, right. no worries. Um, but anyhow, they they spent a lot of time. Um, Leo Smith, I'm sorry, Leo's running for office over in Atlanta right now. Okay, and they spent a lot of time around the state helping us try to get our message out. And our message, if you go into a black church, our message in the black church is almost the same thing it is in the white church. And uh, I think we picked up a lot of momentum. I don't know that uh, we did as well with the Trump election as we did the year a couple of years before, but I think that one of the things that we have to be aware of, if we get 20 25 percent of the black vote in Georgia, we can't lose in Georgia. And that should be a goal of ours to try to get there. Do you think the rhetoric um, at the top of the, at the top of the ticket um, with regard to if you want to, or the building the wall um, or, or the so-called Muslim ban, do you think that hurts what, what maybe you are trying to do or other party, state parties, local parties are trying to do with that minority outreach or, or the different ethnic group outreach efforts? Because it, it, that is such an amplified message. Well, it depends on how that, it depends on how it gets portrayed in those different voting blocks. Okay. And whether we have an opportunity to blunt some of the, the uh, misinformation that's out there. And um, so it's hard to tell right now. Um, if, I, I'd hate to have to bet my income for the next several years on whether or not uh, we were going to make uh, big inroads uh, into minority uh, groups over those two issues. Mm -hmm. I, just, I don't know. What about criminal justice reform? That's been one of one of, one of Nathan Deal's signature programs: re reforming uh, sentencing laws, uh, uh, dr diversion programs for for drug, nonviolent, first-time offenders. Um, that's something that's really taken him in a different direction than than sort of the older law and order style uh, Republican, at least in tone. Um, We'll see how it plays out in practice, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now. What kind of influence do you think that has on, on, on the branding and, and selling of the Republican Party? Yeah, I think it's, uh, to use that term again, huge. Um, we need to be able to get the message out about it. Um, you know, when Governor Deal makes a speech, he always brings it up. Sure. But it's something I've been in favor of personally for a long time, and I think that that his, you know, there's a couple of uh, parts of what he's doing. One is to be sure that someone who's in jail for something that's not a, a, a really bad offense, right. they have an opportunity to get out. And if they use that opportunity, they actually progress and get out. And then he's got this other side of this where he's trying to make job training available so those folks got a job. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary idea. We'll see how it works down the road, but right now it seems to be working pretty well. Why have the Democratic why why has the Democratic Party in Georgia um, not been able to make? I mean, they've been it, the party's been out out of the governor's mansion since two thousand three, January two thousand three. Lost the Senate with a few crossovers with Jack Hill and, and some others right after that election. Mm -hmm. uh, lost the Georgia House in two thousand five. Why has the Demo why has the Democratic Party, even though they've been out of power for so long, not been able to mount something, some kind of a, a well resurgence? A couple of reasons. One that pops into mind is, if you look at uh, their their gubernatorial part of their ballot, mm -hmm. and then look at all their down ticket races: Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, Attorney General. No, yep. Um, labor commissioner, ag commissioner, insurance commissioner, all the way down, the down ticket. 
and you're a historian. Mm -hmm. In the last three elections, name me one person that ran as a Democrat for any of those races. Uh. That's that's why. <laughs> that's why they're running people just to fill a spot on the Keith back. Heard. He was a yeah. Ah, there we go. That's, 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 that's not fair. Just on a, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not fair. That's not but fair. But that's one of the problems, and they've got no. They got no bullpen. They got no bench. One of the things that I had as chairman, I mean, I had a huge bench. If yeah. Governor Deal decided he wasn't going to run last time, I mean, good Lord, we'd had 40 people trying to run for governor probably. And I don't know what we're going to have when it's, you know, his turn out of the box. Mm -hmm. But they don't have a bench. They don't have any, they literally do not have anybody. They have to make people popular people. Like these two Stacys, people are going to know whoever the candidate is down the road, but they're not going to really know them like they know our officials. Do you think you've meant, you've mentioned you know, some of the the bench? Uh, we, we've got Casey Cagle, who's obviously been lieutenant governor since two thousand and seven. Who who are some of the future? What's the future of the the, the Republican Party? Uh, in terms of you know, candidates, future leaders. Oh, Houston Games. Full disclosure: Houston is running for for the hundred and seventeenth. He's running district. for Regina Quick's judge. Vacated. Judge Quick. Yeah. Um, vacated seat. I'm not. I'm not being. I'm not kidding or being. I'm serious. He's really a bright young Republican mm -hmm. young man. He's got a big future. Uh, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to try to pick them, but I pick Houston. Fair, fair enough. Pick anybody else. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. What does what does Georgia politics look like 10, 20 years down the road? Well, to be candid with you, I think we will have. The, uh, it's hard to here again. This is really hard. It's to a predict completely right now unfair question. Because I, I don't know what's going to happen when we get around to redistricting this next time. Okay. And uh, that's probably the primary reason we need uh, Secretary of State and, and the governorship uh, in Republican hands mm -hmm. uh, down the road. I just, um, uh, I think that'll probably determine whether we are able to hold on to the, the volume of elected folks that we have right now. But I have to tell you, around the state, in the sheriffs and county commissioners and you know, um, uh, mayors. Uh, we've grown in the last mm -hmm. four or five years, and that's a that's a that's a big indication that uh, we we've got people. In, uh, this bench we're talking about it goes way deep. I mean, it's all the way back from a, from a uh, county commissioner to the state house and senate. And I just uh, I don't know how it's going to pan out based on that redistricting. Though that's going to be a really interesting thing to, to watch. Do you think Democrats will be able to win, are more likely to win a statewide election than they are to slowly build up a majority the way Republicans were able to do? If they don't build up their base, mm -hmm. I mean their uh, bench, winning a statewide race is going to continue to be really problematic. So, so you're, you're definitely of the mind that, that building a competitive party is, is, is bottom up, not sort of a decapitation top down strategy. Yeah, I want people that wanted to go vote for um, uh, for uh, Brian Kemp, and then while they were there, they voted for governor. <laughs> okay, you know, I'm looking for those kind of voters too around the state. Mm -hmm. I want a Republican to go vote for whatever reason they're going to go vote. And when you got all these folks that have been running around the state for two years and talking about being a labor commissioner and this is what we've done, the insurance commissioner, this is what we've done, and making speeches, that makes it exceedingly difficult for the Democrats to get much traction. You mentioned the, the, the lack of a, a Democratic bench, and we're, we're, you know, you and I are both from Athens. The name that is back in the news is John Barrow. Yeah, I tried to beat him for 35 years and finally got him, and now he's back. He, he, he's back. <laughs> Do you think John, John Barrow's obviously a very, very skilled, very. obviously, um, yeah. raising money. Um, is there any way that, that John Barrow... A candidate like John Barrow can make uh, 
make his way back into to statewide office? Nope. Nope. The, the, you just don't think the electorate is there statewide? No. I don't. Not for Secretary of State. You think that's just too obscure or, or, or down ticket or, or just? Well, I think that whoever comes out of our primary based on the folks that are running for Secretary of State are going to come out knowing what they're doing and going to be really good at what they're uh, at running a campaign statewide. They're really good. Okay. Well, is there anything else you'd like to no, record I for posterity? I appreciate the opportunity and thank you very much. And uh, as always, I thank my wife for allowing me to come over and spend the time with you today because <laughs> without Mary, I wouldn't have been able to be political for all these years. Well, fair enough. Mr. Padgett, thank you very much for participating. Uh, the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program, sponsored by the Richard Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Thank you very much.